on the broadcast tonight. On the second and final day of his state visit to South Korea, Chinese President Xi Jinping highlights the joint sufferings of Korea and China under Japanese militarism. This during a speech to a group of Korean university students. President Park Geun-hye and the visiting Chinese president attend a joint business forum in Seoul, meeting with some 500 business leaders from the two countries. And Japan lifts some of its North Korea sanctions as Pyongyang announces the details of a new probe into the fate of Japanese nationals abducted by North Korea in the 1970s and 80s. Early edition begins now. I see trees of green, red roses. 늘 남편 먼저, 늘 자식 먼저. 레이디 퍼스트라는 말을 잊고 살아온 당신. 오늘만큼은 세상 누구보다 당신이 먼저입니다. 한분한분 한분 특별하게 모시겠습니다. Excellence in flight, Korean Air. It is 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Beijing, and 6 p.m. on Friday, the 4th of July here in Seoul. Live from Seoul, I'm Moon Gon Young. And I'm Daniel Che. Thank you for joining us. Well, Chinese President Xi Jinping is wrapping up his day two of state visit to South Korea as we speak. Well, he started off the day addressing a group of students at one of Korea's major universities where he emphasized the strong ties between South Korea and China, but he had much more to say. Our Jim young has more. President Xi Jinping became the first Chinese president to speak to a group of Korean students at a local university on Friday. In an address to some 500 students at Seoul National University, the Chinese leader vowed to further strengthen bilateral relations between Seoul and Beijing through this strategic cooperative partnership. He used strong words to recount the suffering of China and Korea under Japan's militarism in the early 20th century, describing Tokyo's actions against the two countries as barbarous and aggressive. She said that when the war against Japan was at its height, the Chinese and Korean people experienced a shared suffering and gave sweat and blood to help each other. The Chinese president's evocation of Tokyo's military past is seen by many as a call for Korea and China to confront Japan over its denials of history. He also said that both countries could deepen their mutual understanding by diversifying their cooperation in the culture arena. China will open up a new horizon in China-Korea relations as China will pursue peace and cooperation between the two countries. China and Korea must cooperate in order to open up new opportunities. We will strengthen cultural exchanges in the humanities and liberal arts. This will help foster friendly ties among the people of both countries. President Xi said Korea and China are each other's closest partner, biggest investor and most favored place for travel, which has led to rapid growth in Korea-China relations. Kim young Arirang News. Now, while the two leaders left Japan's historical denials out of their joint communique on Thursday following bilateral talks, the two leaders did bring up Tokyo's review of the Kono statement at a luncheon they both attended on this Friday. President Park and she said they regretted the review of the 1993 statement that acknowledged for the first time that the Japanese military had forced women into sexual slavery during World War II. We'll have more on that in a later newscast. Meanwhile, President Xi Jinping followed up his speech at Seoul National University by meeting with Chinese and Korean business leaders alongside President Park Geun-hye. The Korean leader used the opportunity to put forth a three-point vision of the future for Seoul Beijing economic cooperation, and here's our Che Yusun with this story. 
At a forum of Korean and Chinese business leaders alongside a Chinese counterpart, President Park laid out a vision for the future of economic cooperation between the two countries. Citing economic achievements from their two decades of bilateral ties, the Korean president stressed the need to diversify two-way cooperation from its current focus on the manufacturing sector. She said Seoul and Beijing should expand exchanges into the service sector in medicine, cultural contents and finance, and that the direct one yuan currency trade market that she and President Xi agreed to establish should help spur a new form of cooperation. President Bak also talked about jointly developing and commercializing technologies in areas related to energy, environment and climate change. Referring to trade relations, the Korean leader said it's now time to establish a stable trading environment through an FTA and expand the two countries' reach into each other's markets. She also pitched Korea's trade pacts with 47 nations to Chinese investors, saying that by investing in Korea, they would be extending their reach in the global market. President Buck then proposed linking her Eurasia initiative of expanding energy and logistics infrastructure across the continent and Beijing's new Silk Road vision. She said merging the two would boost Korea and China's competitive edge. In her final remarks to the business leaders, President Buck said the future of Korea and China's co-prosperity lies with their efforts and cooperation between the two governments. Wrapping up their two-day visit to Seoul, President Xi and the First Lady returned to Beijing on this Friday. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. Now, during their bilateral summit on Thursday, Presidents Park and Xi agreed to accelerate efforts to remove tariffs on each other's products. Now, this is expected to give the much-needed momentum to the ongoing Seoul-Beijing FT negotiations. China is Korea's biggest export market, while Korea is China's third-largest trading partner, so it makes sense. Our Song ji reports on the impact a free trade deal could have on Korea. Chinese President Xi Jinping, in a joint post-summit press briefing with President Park Geun-hye on Thursday, emphasized their will to wrap up negotiations for a bilateral free trade deal by the end of this year. Delegations from the two sides, who have already held 11 rounds of talks, will try to hammer out their remaining differences later this month. The two leaders expect the free trade deal to increase two-way trade to 300 billion U.S. dollars next year, from 230 billion dollars in 2013. With shipments to China accounting for one-fifth of Korea's exports, the finance ministry expects Korea's GDP to rise by up to 3 percent over the next 10 years after the FDA takes effect. Korean automakers will benefit the most as the free trade deal is expected to gradually remove the 22.5 percent tariff China levies on foreign cars. But Korea's agriculture and fisheries industries could be slammed by an influx of cheap Chinese products with some exports predicting an annual upper fall of some $3 billion. The Korean side wants to exclude as many agriculture products as possible by designating them as extremely sensitive items. Farmers here have urged the government to draw programs to compensate for an expected surge of Chinese products that already take up the lion's share of imported food. If Seoul and Beijing successfully conclude the trade pact, Korea will have established free trade deals with the world's three most influential economic powers the U.S., the European Union, and China. Song ji Arirang News. Well, Chinese President Xi Jinping concludes his two-day state visit to South Korea on this Friday. The Chinese leader's visit has been significant for various reasons. One, because it was a breakaway from tradition coming to South Korea before going to the north. And also, too, also due to the huge business delegation that he traveled with. The, pro the two presidents met with some 500 business leaders from the two countries in a joint investors forum earlier this afternoon. Well, lots of business and economic implications there. Let's take an in-depth look. Uh, Dr. Hwang byung tae joins us live in the studio. He served as a South Korean ambassador to China in the mid-1990s. Ambassador Hwang, welcome to the program. Hi. Now, uh, before we head into the business and economic aspects of things, uh, we would first like to hear your thoughts on the significance of the Korea-China summit uh, this time around. I would like to emphasize the significance of the, this meeting was that uh, it is the first time since the Chinese leader came to Korea as a state of the country who declared himself no more regional country but the worldwide powers. So in that means, you know, the, his coming to Korea signified that 
Korea and uh, China is full-fledged you know, relationships. As a member of the world class, you know, the, uh, the, the consideration, right. yes. Previously, we just uh, they are uh, regional countries and tied with the you know, communist camp. But these times, they are you know, nothing to do with the communist camps. And they are you know, uh, traveling around you know, the Pacific areas with the United States as number two world powers. That is you know, quite a different significance, yes. All right, how far we've come, and we are actually looking towards the same direction in the future together, so that's significant. Well, we had the uh, Joint Business Forum where President Park and Xi both attended, and we had some big names, movers and shakers there. Any significance there, Ambassador, uh, and any points that we should note there? Well, uh, if we look down the uh, joint communiques, uh, especially in economic areas, it covered the, the wide range of the subject, uh, which is prevalent in the normal economic relationship between advanced countries. So there is no any discern that the Korea is you know, something, you know, the uh, new entry into the, uh, the business because uh, we are full-fledged member of the China's worldwide management of the, uh, the economic relationship. Yes. All right. Um, now, which industries in particular do you think uh, will really get a boost from this summit um, and, and, this, and this business forum? And let's first begin with the Korean side. Well, the uh, main theme of the, the economic discussion was so-called uh, FDAs. FDA is, you know, the uh, raw uh, custom for each product of exchange between two countries. Naturally, uh, we are going to get the benefit in uh, electronics and machinery and uh, automobiles. But meanwhile, so we are getting a you little know, disadvantage uh, in the agriculture product and some uh, service industries. But uh, this is uh, the initial period of you know, the agreement. But once we get move on, move on, so they will be you know, so leverage out each other. So the, both countries will benefit equalities and uh, well, enjoy you know, the, the mutual relationship. benefits. Yes, mutual benefits. Right. Yeah. What about on the Chinese side? Are there specific industries that Chinese industries uh, that will benefit from uh, this uh, this business relationship? I think you know, in discussing with us uh, trade agreement, uh, China is uh, looking toward a wide spectrum of the dear. Uh, relationship with the worldwide uh, economic relationships. Therefore, uh, many subject, many you know, item was uh, already covered in a normal type of uh, transaction between advanced uh, economic countries. So, uh, no any particular because of the Korea's particular relationship. Rather, it is uh, Korea is one of the countries, major countries, in uh, relation with China, and China is treating Korea as a major partner in their worldwide economic uh, mm -hmm. uh, right. context. Right. Well, nothing better to speed things up, especially when it comes to things like free trade deals, like a handshake, a look in the eye. The two leaders have met. Uh, do you anticipate that from here on we will see some momentum growing? And what can we expect from here on in terms of the FDA? Uh, frankly speaking, so we have a long uh, year of uh, economic uh, contact between two countries, but this is the first time to have uh, the, the FDA. FDA is, you know, some kind of the governmental government agreement on certain aspects of the, the relationships. And it is in document. In document, uh, each country, you know, pledges to certain kind of the goals. So goal is you know, mutual, you know, helps and the mutual you know, growth of the economies. So this is a quite a different uh, the stage from the previous, just an item by item you know, trade relationship. Right, this will definitely yes, uh, be a milestone and uh, uh, really a turning point for Korea-China relations to develop into the next level, into yes, a, yes, a yeah, yeah, advanced yeah. level. All right, Ambassador Hwang byung tae thank you so much for speaking with us this evening. Mm -hmm, yeah. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life, talking with you on air and online, connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues, news and current affairs at its best, with Moon Gon Yong and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6.
Now, after months of government-level talks, the Abe administration is keeping its promise with North Korea and has lifted some of Japan's sanctions on that communist state. This, while North Korea launches a reinvestigation into the fate of Japanese citizens abducted to the North decades ago. Here's our Hwang Sang-hee with this report. Following a cabinet meeting Friday, Japan formalized its decision to relax sanctions against North Korea. These include lifting travel bans to and from Pyongyang, raising the reporting limit for money taken or sent to North Korea, and allowing port calls by North Korean ships to Japan for humanitarian purposes. In response, North Korea's state-run Korean Central News Agency announced the launch of what it called an all-inclusive and comprehensive investigation to determine the fate of several Japanese citizens abducted to the North decades ago. The 30-member special investigative team, headed by the country's vice minister for state security and led by the powerful National Defense Commission, will be granted a special right to probe any organization in the regime. In 2002, North Korea admitted to abducting 13 Japanese citizens in the 1970s and 80s to help train their spies, but Japan believes even more people were kidnapped. South Korea and the United States, Japan's key allies in countering North Korea's nuclear ambitions, have been calling for transparency in the separate dealings to prevent any friction in their trilateral cooperation. But whether Tokyo and Pyongyang's recent overtures will lead to a concrete shift in regional dynamics is keeping the world on edge. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Well, upon President Xi Jinping's visit to Seoul, Beijing has decided to release hard evidence of Japan's wartime atrocities to highlight its past wrongdoings. The Chinese government has also begun revealing confessions by Japanese war criminals and will continue to do so every day for a total of 45 days. Now be warned, there are some disturbing images. Our Yudian reports. The photo shows one of the horrific crimes by Japan's Unit 731. Wearing protective suits, two Japanese soldiers are seen pouring chemicals on a five- to six-year-old girl who is reading in agony. This is just one of the 450 documents revealed by China's State Archives Administration on Japan's biological and chemical warfare during World War II. The fact Unit 731 used poison gas against Chinese soldiers is also described in the document. China has long accused Japan of denying its wartime wrongdoings, and in what's been seen as a timely move, China is releasing evidence of Tokyo's wartime crimes on the occasion of President Xi Jinping's visit to Seoul. On top of the hard evidence, Beijing decided to release confessions of 45 Japanese war criminals, each one for 45 days, on its State Archives Administration website. The handwritten confessions include one that says Japan kidnapped 20 women from Korea and China and used them as prostitutes for Japanese troops. These archives are hard evidence of the heinous crimes committed by Japan's imperialism against the Chinese. An editorial from China's official news agency People's Daily added weight to the move, saying Beijing needs to open the eyes of right-wing extremists in Japan who are denying history and breaking the nation's decades-long pacifist constitution. Yurian, Arirang News. Moving on to other stories, the Dow Jones Industrial Average smashed the 17,000 mark for the first time on Thursday, buoyed by a June jobs report that far outstripped analysts' expectations. The U.S. economy added almost 300,000 new jobs, which helped drive the unemployment rate down to its lowest point in nearly six years. Our Kim ji has the details. Workers in the U.S. finally have something to celebrate. American jobs growth was stronger than expected last month. The U.S. economy added 288,000 jobs in June. That's according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics on Thursday. It helped drive the unemployment rate down to 6.1 percent from 6.3 percent in May. It's the lowest rate since September 2008. I have no doubt that relative to the first quarter, the next three calendar quarters, including the second quarter, will be a lot stronger. And this employment report is consistent with that view. The Dow Jones Industrial Average topped 17,000 for the first time Thursday. And the gains were broad, confirming expectations that the U.S. economy recovered in the second quarter after a dismal start to the year. 
The S&P 500 climbed near the 2000 mark. The Nasdaq closed at its highest point since the year 2000. But investors will have to wait until next week, though, to see if the gaining streak is going to continue, since there's no trading on Friday as it's Independence Day in the United States. Kim Jeong, Naira News. The President Park Geun-hye's approval rating has fallen to a fresh low. In a survey of 1,000 adults conducted this week by Gallup Korea, just 40 percent approved of the President's performance, while 48 percent disapproved. Well, uh, President Park's polling numbers have been on a steady decline over the past three weeks, largely over two failed Prime Minister nominations, if you remember. Now, uh, the negative sentiment towards the president uh, comes at a particularly bad time for the ruling party, which is hoping for a strong showing in the by-elections on July 30th, where at least uh, 15 parliamentary seats will be up for grabs. Well, uh, it looks like a splash of Korea is on its way to the White House dining table. U.S. President Barack Obama's personal chef has come to Korea on a very special mission to learn how to cook Korea's temple fare. And the one that's going to soak it all up is Sam Cast, a senior policy advisor on nutrition at the White House and an advocate of organic food. He paid a visit to Jin Gwansa Temple in northern Seoul where he learned the secrets behind some delicious Korean summer dishes. The Buddhist monks at the temple taught the chef how to make cucumber water kimchi, kongguksu or cold bean noodle soup and other dishes. Well, um, after the cooking class, Cass said that uh, he would prepare the healthy summer dishes he learned during his trip for President Obama, who also asked him to learn how to make bulgogi. Very generic bulgogi. <laughs> well, uh, moving on to arts, uh, legendary ballerina Kang Soo Jin may have assumed the top position at the Korean National Ballet earlier this year, but that doesn't mean she's going to sit behind a desk all day long. Right. She is set to star in a special ballet created just for her that has its Korean premiere this weekend. Our cultural correspondent Park Ji Won sat down with her to talk about the production and the two very demanding roles that she has taken on. This will be one of the few chances to see legendary ballerina Kang Soo Jin perform before her planned retirement from the stage in 2016. So this weekend's ballet Madam Butterfly, which was made and choreographed just for her, is a must-see production. How I interpret, uh, interpret my butterfly is how I am actually. All my color can come out in this Madam Butterfly as a woman. She says the main character Cho Cho San has many different facets, from purity and sensitivity to charismatic strength, which all reflect her personality. When asked how she handles two demanding jobs, director of the National Ballet Company and the performer, she says she enjoys doing both. Being on stage dancing, it gives it's my food, because I always danced because I liked, I loved it. Being director is another thing. I love it. It's such a challenge for me and very important. With uh, all the dancers, all the workers, I think uh, to breathe together, to have uh, the same tempo and same mind, that it can bring the success. And I, I do have uh, this feeling with the National Ballet. The choreographer of this neoclassic ballet says the production would not have been made without Kang. And when the ballet premiered in Austria last year, all the performances were sold out. We did it with, um, yeah, with, with love for what we do, with passion. Yeah. It was very nice for everybody and I, 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 I'm happy about the result. And, and I hope that the, the love that we had doing this production, the public in Korea would feel it also. The ballet runs from Friday to Sunday at the Seoul Arts Center. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Uh, time now to get a check on the weather forecast, and let's turn to our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle, uh, we apparently have a typhoon moving our way, is that correct? 
That's right, Kanyang Typhoon Noguri is moving from Guam in a northwesterly di direction and should reach Japan by next week. But at this time, it's hard to say it's going to reach uh, Korea by that time. Well, I guess we'll have to wait and see. As for the more immediate future, how's the weekend looking, Michelle? Well, most parts of the nation can expect a hot and cloudy weekend, except in some parts of the southern regions where sudden showers are forecast until Monday. And meanwhile, the central region, including Seoul, can expect scorching hot weather tomorrow with highs into the 30s and strong sunshine, so make sure to apply sunblock before heading out. Now going over to our temperature readings, Seoul will start off the morning at 21 and up to 32 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will peak up to 30 and 27 degrees. And moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops over to 23, Tokdo at 24, while Mangkungang tops to 26. And as for the weather conditions at the World Cup in Brazil, there's no rain in the forecast and uh, it's getting hotter by the day and the highs both of the Friday's game will reach into the high 20s under partly cloudy skies. Now that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park and back to you guys. That's right, the World Cup, we almost forgot about that. Well, that well it's about us. to get uh, really competitive there, it's right? It's going to be very competitive. So we hope you get recharged and ready to cheer on your favorite teams, although they might not be Korea. Well, thank you for watching. This has been Daniel Che. And I'm Moon Gan Young, too. The, um, those of you in other parts of the world, have a great start to your day. And we hope to see you right back here, same time, Monday evening. Bye-bye.